So the great day is coming to an end, but we still have to close with a bang. And for that, I'm inviting our keynote, Hunter Verheyen, to talk about agility in the face of perplexity. Please welcome Hunter. Okay. Thank you for the announcement, and, and thank you to you for staying. That's sort of the two sides of closing an event. Uh, it's fun to send people home with sort of the last message of the day, at least those people that decided to stay. So thank you very much for staying. It's cool. Um, I want to talk a little bit about uh, this thing called Agile. Um, that's sort of what I call agility in the face of perplexity. This is an Agile tour event. There's tons of Agile tour events around the world. Um, Everybody knows where the name Agile came from, right? Besides being just a plain English word. Everybody remembers 2011 manifesto, manifesto for Agile Software Development to pull it. Okay, so that's how we ended up with this beautiful name of Agile in our world of mainly IT, software development, product development, product delivery. So that's cool. So le let me check with you guys first a little bit on how you feel about this term Agile. Because it, it's from 2001, so that's uh, February 2001. That's 16 years and a half ago. Uh, for Scrum, it's even worse. Does anybody know how old Scrum is, by the way? Yeah, next week, 22. It was born on the 19th of October, 1995, when Ken and Jeff presented Scrum for the first time at some event. Had been working, sort of the first official. But the term Agile, 16 years and a half old. We're now 2017, 2001. Do you feel like Agile is still relevant? So raise your hand if you feel that nowadays Agile is still worthwhile and maybe even more needed than ever. Who thinks, yeah, Agile is still worthwhile? Okay. The people not raising their hands, it's okay to stay. <laughs> it's fine. You don't, you don't have to go. Okay, other question. Um, do you feel Agile doesn't need to be renamed? It's already difficult enough as it is. Who feels like Agile? Just stick with the name Agile. Or should we invent a new name for it? No? No new names? Okay. Because there's movement around the world. There's modern Agile, agnostic Agile. I'm expecting things like postmodern Agile soon. Maybe, maybe we should go for romantic Agile or, or native Agile. I don't know what... It, I still feel very good about the term Agile. So agree with a lot of people in this audience. Last question. Agile applies to software development only and no, nowhere else. Who feels? No hands go up. Cool. So these are questions that have been bothering me a little bit. So that's nice. But still, so Agile, I still it feels, uh, it feels very valuable for me. I don't need a new name for it. I think it, it covers what we mean with it. Although I still think it's really difficult to explain it. And, and l let me ask you to do a little exercise. We're going to do an exercise of two minutes. Everything we do in, in, in Scrum and Agile is time boxed, as you know. So we're going to, I'm going to give you a time box of two exercises to think about this question a little bit. Just one little question from me as a, a facilitator of this thing. After two minutes, I'm going to raise my hand. If you see me raising my hand or other people raising their hand, please follow my example and stop talking. So after two minutes, and then we'll see what happens. Yeah? So I've got this question. This is, this is a situation I run in regularly when I work with management teams or uh, CXO people, whatever, and they want to know about this thing called Agile and Scrum. They want to be Agile too. So imagine yourselves in a situation. You're in your organization. Finally, management sees the light. They want to be Agile too. And CIO, yeah, I know about this Scrum stuff already. So you're invited as an Agile expert, whatever, to go up to the management team, the CEO, and it's like the, the, the really nice rooms on top of the building in general, where they have like nice wooden chairs and things. Okay. So you're, you're invited to go over there and explain what this thing Agile and Scrum is about. And let me help you a little bit. Maybe what, what would sort of be your definition of Agile that you would use for those management people, so the CEO, the CIO, and so on. And, and, and often CEO, CIO says, I already know about this thing called Scrum. How do you relate Agile and Scrum? So please, take two minutes. Talk to your neighbors for two minutes. Imagine you came here to just talk, not just listen. So take two minutes, talk to your neighbors, quickly form a team, and then we'll see what happens. Take two minutes.
Thank you. Just a couple of people who wants to quickly share how would you approach this? What would you say? What would your definition of Agile be to talk to these people? Yes. I've read it recently and I liked it a lot. Agile is an idea supported by some values and several principles. Okay, cool. Thank you. So, uh, somebody over there? Yeah. Uh, I would like to correlate Agile and Scrum in the sense that uh, you have to value people and not just the process behind it. Mm -hmm. Because one of the principles of Agile is uh, people over process. And if you think about Scrum, Scrum comes, came from the rugby sport where you have to work uh, as a team and things like that. So I would like to just uh, add this correlation between them. Okay, cool. I will tell about benefits and problems what we want to solve. I will not use uh, Agile or uh, Scrum world because it can uh, do some mistakes for understanding me. So in general, I will tell that what we want to solve, how we will solve, and what we will use. Uh, not any name used will be. Yeah, okay, cool. Thanks for sharing. Um, it's not really easy. I've been in this situation a couple of times. It was in general, sort of the other way around, where I was invited to come talk to management teams and they wanted to do Scrum, Agile, whatever. And then uh, my question to them was often, yeah, okay, so we're here to talk about Agile. You want to become Agile. What's Agile to you? What does it mean to you? Often, silence. Often people had no idea. So often I approach the situation then by giving them this. So this is what Agile means to me. Mindset, as expressed in the Agile Manifesto, Manifesto for Agile Software Development, four value statements, 12 principles, and, and Scrum, a very, very tangible way, very actionable way to sort of be Agile. Now, the part about Scrum, that's simple to explain. It's not easy to do, but at least simple to explain. Uh, I, I can explain the rules and the accountabilities of Scrum, making sure that people understand it's, it starts and ends with people first, but still, I can explain Scrum. But explaining Agile as a mindset, and people are like, what's he talking about? What do you mean? And then, and then, like you rightfully said, it often helps to start with, yeah, but why are we here? What sort of problems are we trying to solve? Instead of diving into Agile and, and Scrum and trying to come up with words and definitions, what are we trying to solve? Why are we here? So starting with why often works better. So. Going back to those people, why are we here? What are the problems that you are facing? What are you hoping to solve by going to Agile and Scrum? And then later on we'll see how to do that. So, and, and these are a number of reasons that we often find with organizations. Restoring the connection with users, re-engaging the workforce. Um, in that sense, transparency inside. Where are we all the time knowing things? Quicker, faster, shorter time to market, anything. A lot of reasons. So keep in mind, when you go back to your organization, Imagine there are maybe many reasons to pursue agility. Now, good question for your management people, maybe even, even maybe for your scrum masters. What's the number one reason of your organization? Does your organization have a sort of why in place? Why are we trying to become agile? Or is it just because of the CIO, read in a, in a, in a CIO magazine that everybody's going for scrum or agile? So think about it. And then, um, is this something that sort of unifies your management? And, and knowing a why, or starting with why, often helps to go through all those little ups and downs and transforming, changing, culture, people, whatever you run into, processes and so on. And then understanding that there's a why hmm, might help. So that's often Agile and Scrum. Well, let's start with why. And then explain how Scrum and Agile, the Agile mindset, helps people solving those problems. But it still doesn't solve my problem of that definition of Agile. That flurry, that fuzzy thing called mindset. So here's the definition of agility, because a lot of those problems sort of boil down for me when I summarize it to people. It's, oh, it seems like you're looking for some sort of agility. You want to be more agile? I can explain it as agility. And then sort of definition I made up. The first definition is just plain English thing, quick, nimble, able to adapt, and so on. That's also very general. So um, I've... I've taking this over from a little book I wrote some years ago about Scrum. 
Agility means bring your organization into a state of constant flux, co things constant moving around, changing, evolving, and you want to capitalize on that. You don't want to be baffled by it. You want to you build on that. You want to see that as a strength, as an opportunity. So agility is an organizational capability to adapt. HR is adapting, essentially. So that helps people, but still doesn't solve my problem of what does HR then mean? And, and that was sort of the idea. So four years ago, I wrote a little book. It's called Scrum, a pocket guide. I know, just quick check, just to disappoint myself. Anybody know about my book, by coincidence? Okay, at least, at least some people, thank you. Uh, so a little book called Scrum, a pocket guide. Now, that was 2013. And then I was like, yeah, everything has been said about Scrum. Don't have to write anything anymore. It's all said, it's, it's all in my book. And then uh, it took me one or two years to find out, oh, maybe I want to write a, s an, a next book. And obviously about Scrum again, because that's what I've been doing since 2003. So uh, at first, certainly combined with extreme programming. Anybody remembers extreme programming? Yeah, that should have been sort of the other way around. So uh, most of the hands should go, but still. So extreme programming combined with Scrum, really, really powerful, really, really great to work with. So I've been doing this since 2003, but mainly focusing on Scrum a lot. So my second book was going to be about Scrum, uh, obviously. And then a year ago, sort of my, my, my publisher decided to disrupt my ideas a little bit. And he asked me, shouldn't you write a book sort of like your Scrum Pocket Guide, something like Agile Pocket Guide, -ish, something like that. And I was like, ooh, never considered that. Took me a long time to think about it. And then I, I went out to communities, meetup groups, uh, events, and so on, with those first questions I asked you guys. Do you, you guys, do you still think Agile is valuable? And a lot of people say, yes, but it's so difficult to explain, so difficult to define. Um, it certainly, it's all sort of turned into sort of business over these past 16 years. There's a lot of people that sort of trying to, let's say, embed individual practices that they call agile in sort of an old school context and setup. Sort of the industrial thinking that we're trying to get rid of, then still keep that industrial thinking in place, but just call things agile now. So that helped me see that there might be value in thinking about agile a little bit more. And this is sort of this presentation, sort of the state where I am today. And this, this is sort of uh, what I want to do. Um, my, my hope is, what I've seen a lot is a lot of agile people, we're very good at bashing other people. Saying, no, that's bad. No, not agile, bad. But a lot of people never offer something of a positive alternative. Now, okay, that's bad. But what is saying good? Or what is your positive definition of agile instead of... So, and that's, that's what I trying to do, um, aspiring to go for restoring the simplicity of Agile, um, disentangling sort of the clue, the business, the, the spaghetti type of thing that Agile, anything these days is called Agile. We keep in place all of the old roles, all of the old phases, just we put Agile in front of it and then we're fine, right? Maybe it's not that easy. So that's sort of what I'm looking for. And then I started thinking, yeah, but why is it exactly that we need Agile? So a uh, while ago, I, I, I put this somewhere on Twitter. And somebody picked it up, put a, put, a <laughs> put a photo behind it and so on. So strange things happen in the world. Uh, but complexity is our world and simplicity is our path. Simplicity is how we tackle complexity. The problems that we face, the problems that our challenges are highly complex. They are not simple, but you <coughs> tackle complexity with simplicity. That's what we do with Scrum. That was also the idea of Agile. Keep things simple. Go for simple... Um, tools, patterns, and then um, let very complex patterns and behavior emerge from that. So, and that's sort of my starting point. And I started thinking, okay, well, what does that mean, complexity? It means that in our work, there's a lot of variables play at play. There's a lot of things. So we work in a certain environment. We have to produce certain outcomes or results. It's uh, done by certain people or whatever, let's call them players. And, and we have to... Um, go into a number of activities to achieve that. And then thinking, what, what defines complexity? Well, the stability of the environment. Are you working in a stable environment? And that's not just the internal environment, but also the markets you're working with, competition and so on. Is that really stable? Or is that sort of in constant turmoil? And even if it's stable, think about, yeah, but for how long is it stable? Against what sort of horizon? What sort of timelines? Might be stable for a month, might not be so stable if you look at it for 
somewhat longer period. The outcomes that you have to produce, can you really predefine your outcomes and expect them not to change or is it in motion all the time? Is it sort of repetitive work that you do, repeatable work? Have you, have you done this over and over again? Just do it as you used to do in the past and then, yeah, everything fine, everything success? Or does it more have to be really inventive, create new, new solutions um, almost on a daily basis? And, and the players doing this, are they like robotic things, replaceable pieces of machinery? Or are they like really people, human beings being with a lot of creative potential and not just programmable robots. Well, a little bit, can I share something with you? I, I was a little bit fascinated by seeing a tool out there being presented as a tool to optimize resource allocation. That sort of sends shivers down my spine. People are not resources. People are people, human beings. People are not resources. It's not about utilization, your allocation, that sort of... Hmm, let's get over that. So. <laughs> Some parameters, and you know what? If things are stable, predefined, repetitive, robotic, you don't probably don't need a process anyhow. Just do it. It's as simple as that. But you know what? That's not probably not the only work variables I have. You might think about other variables. And then what is important for me is that sort of when things are, let's say, rather simple, stable, and so on, they're ordered, nothing changes, nothing too much, not, nothing, nothing too much uh, on, on pr unpredictability, then you're operating in what I would call the ordered stability space. Your work is in the ordered stability space. Everything is fine, everything is under control, there's no, no big problems ahead of us. But if you're moving away from those things, you're working in what I call the complex novelty space. It's about complexity, it's about novel work, it's about new product development, new results, and so on. But you know what? This is not limited to software development anyhow. This is all over the place in nowadays world. We are quickly shifting from that old school industrial world of repetitive mechanics, mechanistic work, repeatable work, predicted, predictable work. We are quickly moving into that complex novelty space and not just software development, economy, uh, government. The world is highly unpredictable. The world has always been unpredictable, but we're now acknowledging it, that's sort of the idea. So the majority of the work is happening in what I call the complex novelty space, hence the need for more agility. That's why I think there's value in what I call the agile paradigm, that sort of different new worldview on how to deal with work and results and how to work with people. So that helped me see, oh, maybe there's value in describing a little book about agile. So that helped me discover sort of, yeah, there's a why to it. So the first time I presented this was a couple of weeks ago in Denmark. Um, and then uh, at the beginning did the same questions, who sees value in, in, uh, in Agile and so on. And I was sort of fascinated that afterwards, after the presentation, somebody said on, put on LinkedIn, wow, cool, Gunther. I, I must admit that I said no by the beginning. And then I realized by the end, I should have said yes because the world is highly unpredictable and not just IT software development. That's where Agile came from, but I think that Agile paradigm, that worldview of Agile is applicable in many more circumstances and in many more sorts of work. So, because we're operating in a complex novelty space, meaning there's a lot of change coming towards us, it's a real-time world, it's an online world, um, there's too much information approaching us all the time, a lot more than in the past. In the past, you could read the newspaper once a day, and get up to speed. Now you have to be online every single minute of every single hour. So, and, and technology is everywhere. Um, a couple of years ago, we could ask the question and get some laughter still. Do you have an app for that? Now apps are all over the place. They, they determine our world. Our energy, our resources are all determined by software and software products and technology. So it's everywhere and it's highly impacting um, how we work, how we relate to other people, relationships, how we have to work as teams, how we have to solve complexity. Uh, to put it short, the time of the sort of single hero is way beyond us. The world has become too unpredictable, too complex, too many changes, too many variables at play. This is no longer something that individual people just can handle and solve. Yeah? So, and I call this agility in the face of perplexity, giving you my definition of agility. Let me add a little sort of definition of perplexity. Again, the first part, the official English thing. Now for me, perplexity has a sort of um, dark side and a sort of light side, positive side and uh, maybe not so positive side. So um, 
it's at least an entangled state. It's some complications that you look at, wow, it's highly perplex. Uh, but the downside is um, it leads to the inability to act. Now, how can we avoid complexity or the complex novelty space turning into that sort of negative perplexity? How can we see it as something that liberates us, that gives us lots of opportunities? And I think that's where we need that agile mind state. So that's where we need the agile paradigm. We need it more than ever. So when thinking about this, I had to look back at sort of my only personal history in, 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 in Agile and Scrum since 2003. In order to make it tangible and clear and, and almost a defined thing, what is it that made Scrum work for me? And it's like <coughs> you said, it's not just the process. The process helps, the process supports us, but the process of Scrum in itself is not going to save, uh, save us. It's just a good way to work, but still, you can, you can just mechanically follow the process and, and that's about it. Or you can use Scrum to implement a completely upfront defined list of requirements. And yeah, you will not get much more benefits out of it. So what is it that makes that agile paradigm work for me? So I had to think about it, long back and forth. And this is sort of the result of a long thinking process. Came up with what I would call the, what I call the prime agile tenets. Three things that make Agile and Scrum work for me. First of all, people. It starts and ends with people, but not just people. Sort of a trait of those people is what I call collaborative. Collaborative people. I'll come back to that. And, and it's sort of, that is sort of the who and then sort of the how. We thrive on emergence. It's not about predicting, predefining stuff anymore, preempting answers. It's about emergence. There's too much unpredictability. But it's not just emergence in the sense of sitting around and waiting for things to emerge. No, no, we have to provoke emergence. So that's why I call it deliberate emergence. We, we, we set out, we try something, we make sure that something emerges. We don't know what, but we'll be emerging stuff and then hmm, show our capability to deal with it. And then it's about value for a purpose. The times of big bang deliveries, um, going into production after two years of work, they're over. That doesn't work anymore. Think about maximizing value. Maximizing value works <laughs> a lot better if you know why you're doing all of this. So this is your why. If you have a purpose, if your organization has a, has a purpose. Your organization, great purpose might be making lots of money. Cool. Maybe not too engaging as a purpose. I think we can do a lot better than that. But this is sort of, this is what makes Agile work. This is what turns Scrum in product delivery into success. This is what the Agile paradigm is about for me. And this is for me, my sort of positive definition of, of Agile. Just of bashing, not good, bad. No, collaborative people, deliberate emergence, and value for a purpose. And let me go into that a little bit. Collaborative, that's sort of stance that people take. We believe a lot in working as teams, but not everybody's going to be part of a team, not everybody maybe wants to be part of a team. Does that make people useless? No, not necessarily. You can be collaborative and not be part of a team. Collaborative means for me that sort of, it's a stance, it's how you look at things, being prepared, being willing, being able to step in, bring in skills, expertise, with a team, from outside of a team, it's all about collaboration. So, and that's sort of regardless of title, position, hierarchy. You can have titles in place, badges in place, colors, whatever you have. You know what? That shouldn't change the way that you deal with demands for collaboration. Bring in your skills and expertise. Yeah. So that's for me, collaborative people. I'm going to think about uh, some perspective I've defined. Certainly going to talk about accountability. Um, certainly relates to the current value of commitment. Um, it's a lot about dedication. Accountability, meaning able demonstrating accountability. Uh, it's a lot better than having to ask people to show accountability. What if people would sort of from intrinsic motivation and so on, beyond rewards and whatever that you have in place, demonstrate accountability. Professionalism, come back to that. And certainly an aspect of teamwork, working as teams. What's the power of working as teams? How do you bring in skills in a team? How do you become a team? And we know shared purpose and so on certainly helps, shared agreements, shared values, principles, certainly work to overcome ego and so on. Yeah? So, but collaborative people, that's the who of Agile. Now, how of Agile, in the, in the complex novelty space, they will change, more will change than will remain stable. Think about 
those four parameters, the activities, the players in, 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 in at play, the environment that you work in, if you think about it carefully, more will change than will remain stable. So that's the end of predictions. They don't work anymore. They might work for a time span of sort of like the weather. You can do that for the next day, maybe for the next sprint or the next situation, certainly not for the next couple of years. That's an illusion. That won't, doesn't work anymore. So we're going to have to embrace emergence, deliberate emergence, meaning time boxing our efforts, but provoking feedback, looking actively looking for feedback, setting off some processes, looking for options, gathering feedback and see what we do with it. And it's all sort of based on the idea that what works today might not work tomorrow, certainly not next year. So it's about not necessarily about continuous improvement, sort of sick of that, sick of that term a little bit, it's continuous improvement for me still reflects a lot of people use it. It's like always up, always more. What about continuous adaptation? Being able to continuously adapt to new circumstances because what works today might not work tomorrow. So what about, it's not always cumulative. That's sort of the, the idea. And then, so that's how we do stuff and why we do stuff. What are we trying to achieve value for a purpose? So it's not about um, actuals. How much time did you spend on that? How, no, it's looking forward. It's about value. And you can measure value. Uh, the value that your products, your results bring to your organization, to your stakeholders, certainly to your users and customer, customers, and continuously optimizing value. What is valuable today might not be tomorrow or next year. So think about it. Keep that in mind. It's not about big bang delivery anymore. Optimizing value. Value is always in an end-to-end -end result. Intermediate artifacts, intermediate documents, whatever, they, have, they are not potentially valuable. So that's sort of the focus again on finished products. And that's sort of the essence for me of HR. Collaborative people, deliberate emergence, and working towards optimizing, maximizing value all the time for a purpose, hopefully. So we'll think about it more, but it's sort of, you can measure this. Um, this hopefully also brings people to think beyond team metrics beyond things like velocity or productivity, whatever. Who cares about the productivity of the team? What if you would care about the value that's in your results, in your product, the value th that you bring to the market against your competition and so on? And what about sprint or iteration after iteration, optimizing that value? Who cares about how much, how much work is involved in doing that? So, and again, think about it. What is important today might not be important tomorrow because that's part of the ever-changing world. So, here's a little exercise again. I told you about those perspectives to the prime edge alternate. Um, there's one aspect for me that sort of sticks out, been thinking about a lot, professionalism or professionals. It's a term that pops up a lot in our uh, beautiful world of agile and scrum, professionalism. So, can you take two minutes again for me and think about this question. What does professionalism mean for you guys? So again, reform as teams or look for other people to form a team. Take two minutes again. What does that mean for you? And, and how might that be important? What's the importance of professionalism? Because, you know, everybody uses the word. So can you take two minutes with your teams again? So think about professionalism.
Thanks. I hope we can go on for hours like this, but it's only two minutes. So professionalism or being a professional, what does it mean for you guys? Anybody? Some keywords, some commitment? Yes. Dedication? Liking what you do? Hmm? Knowledge? Mm -hmm. Okay. Wait, we're gonna use the mic, otherwise we're gonna lose you. Stanislava, yeah. I'll pass it to you. Yeah. Uh, for me, professionalism is always growing step more from where you are now mm -hmm. and being able to receive feedback on everything you do. Okay. So mastery in a, s in, in, in a way? Not, not having to change job title every two years in order to get more salary, but just becoming better at what you do might be good. Yeah. I see in terms of respect for the company that you work for, for your colleagues. So in this mm -hmm. sense, in terms of the respect. Okay, so some values, commitment, respect. Yeah, there was some over here. You wanna have the mic to share? Uh? Knowledge on the field okay. and uh, wise application of it. Yeah. Yeah, more thoughts? Work ethics. Ethics? Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. Yeah. I want to I share a couple of personal stories. Because this is a sort of very vague thing. There's no established definition of this. I just want to share a couple of stories from my personal life. So, um, three years ago, four years ago almost, uh, my wife and I and our family, we moved houses. So, we went to a different house. Uh, we had a complete clear finished house completely done we didn't like that anymore so we went to go for buyer sort of old house and in belgium old that means our house is from 75 1975 uh, so uh, it's pretty old and it means there was some uh, at least some renovation projects at least for the rest of our days so that's cool we like that one of the things that we had to get done was sort of the electricity it wasn't that bad, but still, we had like those por porcelain uh, fuses and so on that had to be fixed. So we had a, a couple of months before we had to move into the new house. Had a really great electrician, and um, I, I'm, I'm not sure whether it was really professional, but I don't know. Let let me share the story. So by the time we moved houses, electricity was fine. So it was a new uh, new things happening over there. It was all all set. Technically, really well done. I was really very sure we could move houses, turn the electricity on, nothing would blow, nothing would burn, things like that. No short uh, circuits and so on. So I would consider that man a really good craftsman. Technical expertise, he knew the, he knew the rules, the regulations, he could explain why he had done stuff. Yeah, but law says we have to do like this, so all things that are connected to water, water things like the bathroom, the kitchen and so on, all separate and so on, really nice. The reason why I still didn't consider that guy a really professional is because he was like always late, not showing up at the times he said he would be there, last minute calls, yeah, it's going to be two days later and so on. Uh, he had plenty of time, so there were, in that sense, no, by the beginning, no deadlines until he turned everything into a deadline because our moving date was approaching. It was all sort of not reliable, so I was sort of thinking. So, great craftsman, the work that he does, technically well done, he knows how to do it, really great, but as, as sort of a customer, I couldn't rely on him. He gave me a phone call like five minutes before nine o'clock, yeah, I know I should have been there, but it's going to be tomorrow. That's not funny, and in the end, he accumulated so much of those delays that he had to rush into getting everything done the last couple of days before we had to move houses, and we really had to move. So, in that sense, by that sort of behavior, he in almost endangered our moving day, which was not funny. Although technically, well done. I would say craftsman. So out goes the electrician. In comes a new electrician. And this is something that happens at some point in time. We made a choice for whatever reason in our house to use uh, black uh, plugs and black, uh, black sockets. Whatever. We felt that was more nice. At some point in time, new electrician came in and he had to uh, still fix, replace one of the old things with a with new socket. And he came in with a white one. I said, why a white one? 
Everything is black. The rest of the house is all black sockets. Why are you bringing a white man? Yeah, oh damn. I thought it was going to be behind a cupboard. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, first of all, even if it would have been behind a cupboard, I still wanted it to be black. Because it's black all over the place. And I, I like things to be like sort of nice. So that, that's sort of an indication again. Sort of, I felt there was sort of lack of professionalism. Plus it's not a decision that... It's not his decision. It's our decision. Gunter gave me. He could have given me a call. Gunter, we can come in, and I, I, I'm planning to bring a white. No, no, I want black, even if it's behind the cupboard, which, by the way, wasn't the case. So it was in full sight. So we now have one white thing, and so out goes the electrician again. And this is a fictive story, but I wouldn't like to end up with somebody who's not even a craftsman. Um, who might do lots of things with electricity and then says, yeah, Gunther, you can turn it on. I would, I would, I, I, I'm not a professional electrician myself. I can, I can change some stuff, but that's about it. So I would hope that I can rely on something, uh, somebody to be reliable, not just technically, but also in his behavior. So that's sort of, for me, what combines prof what, what is in professionalism. You want people with sort of technical insights, excellent skills, maybe expertise, but they can grow. But there's also this behavioral aspect. And that's maybe where the scrum values come in. Yeah? Commitment, focus, openness, respect, courage, and so on. So a professional is for somebody, for me, somebody who combines not just technical craftspersonship, but also some sort of personal credibility, integrity, some, somebody I can rely on. I can trust, not only technically, but also not letting me down, consulting me when there's something that needs to happen. Sort of, I was reminded that again, sort of last week, the car of my wife needed to be repaired, and uh, no problem, we had an appointment at the garage and, and so on, and in the evening my wife goes to collect her car, yeah, you know what, you have to be a little bit careful with that, because we fix it like this, because if we would have, have done it like that, it would have costed you more. But, so, yeah, what, what's stopping you from giving us a call saying, hey, Gunter, or my wife, this is how we can do it. You can do it like this, but and then you're going to have to be careful. If you do it like that, it's just going to cost. It's not their decision to make. That is not professional. Although, yeah, the fix is probably good, but still it's not professional. So that's sort of examples that I see, whoa, this is for me professionalism. If I then think about acting or working in what I call the complex novelty space, there's a couple of, for me, new dimensions to what I would call professionalism, honestly. And that means agile professionals, or professionals operating in the agile space, um, are those craft personalities with that collaborative stance, willing, able to collaborate. Part of a team, not part of a team, doesn't make a difference. Rank, hierarchy, title, doesn't make a difference. Because that's how you deal with complex challenges. You can't solve things as a superhero on your own anymore. And uh, probably you know better than your boss does, so why would he tell you what to do? But still, um, I see a lot of people pretending, yeah, and oh, no, 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 that's going to be easy, that's simple. No, no, it's complex. Don't misrepresent complexity as something that is simple. Don't present, don't, don't pretend like it's actually the complex novelty space. Don't pretend as if it's in the audit stability space. That's going to cause a lot of troubles. Because it assumes predictability, repeatable stuff, you've done this before, you know how much time this is exactly going to take so that the other... No, no, no. That sort of ignores deliberate emergence, but also ignores the, the innov innovative capabilities, the creativity of people. And certainly, do not promise certainty where there is no certainty. Yeah, no problem. We'll be done by that date. That is promising certainty where there is no certainty. Help people drive on deliberate emergence and by that you can forecast you can look in the future but there's always some unpredictability always so the, and that sort of professionalism people that say yo no problem we'll be ready by then you can't tell that because there's the environment there's uh requirements might be changing technology might not be doing what you're hoping for and it's not just in it it's all over the place so do not pretend that you're able to predict the inherently unpredictable a lot of what we do, it's complex novelty space. It's inherently unpredictable, so don't pretend as if... And then it certainly applies to a lot of uh, transformations and stuff. Um, I've been talking a lot with what I call Reversify, helping people to sort of re-emerge their organizations based upon Scrum, um, and Scrum then sort of done properly. Um, and that's a path. 
I'm not telling any organization how they should look like in the future. I'm not telling anybody, you should now be calling everything squads and teams and guilds and whatever. That's, that's a solution. I want to I wanna help people find their own solution. And I think the complex novelty space, certainly with regards to organizations and, and organizational setups and, and constructions, you can't tell an organization how they should look like in a year from now, in two years from now. I think a professional operating in the agile space, acknowledging complex novelty, will show people a road of discovery. It's a journey. They will discover how they will look like. So don't mix up the journey or the path with the destination. I can't tell an organization how they should look like. Yeah? And then, I already told you, it's about simplicity. Simplicity is not simplistic. I often see, yeah, the three rules to start up a new team. As if that's a universal law. As if for every team on the world, you follow those three rules and the team will successfully start up. That's simplistic. That is not the simplicity we're looking for. Uh, deliberate emergence, working, working in, in time-boxed uh, efforts, looking back regularly, helping, inspecting, adapting, changing your road, changing direction, and so on. That's the simplicity. From simplicity, we have um, emergent complex behavior, but don't represent complexity as simple. That's simplistic. That's not the way to go. So this is sort of things that I would say that it thrives on the prime agile tenets. So, and then one last aspect, um, prime agile tenets, collaborati co collaborative people, uh, deliberate emergence, value for a purpose. How's that working in an organization? And how's that working with growth and, and at scale? I like the term growth more than scale, so scale is so, I don't know. Um, what I see happening with a lot of companies, so they're at some point in time, they're at some sort of size. They have a sort of volume. Let's call it a little tree, Let's, they start up. You can grow, you can make the tree bigger, more branches, more uh, bigger trunk, higher trunk, and so on. But you know what? If you really want to wanna prosper, if you really want to grow properly, at some point in time, you're going to have to want to bear fruits. A lot of companies, do you know, do, do you know the expression binge drinking? People just drinking until they drop dead. Drinking and drinking, binge drinking. They've now invented something like binge, binge watching an English term. It's like uh, looking at all the seasons of Game of Thrones in a row, consecutively, without any break, sort of binge drinking. I know quite some organizations that are into binge merging. Yeah, buying another company and another company. It's like you're a tree. Oh, put a tree on top of it. Put a tree over there. You know, at some point in time, if you really want to have a return on that growth and expansions and so on, you want to make sure that you stop expanding and now create some fruits so that you can eat and that you have a healthy tree. A lot of people are sort of addicted to expanding and growing and it's all about scale. It's all bigger, bigger, bigger. What if there would be... So considering your organization, sort of how are you balancing your energy and resources? Growing, fine, expanding. But at some point in time, you want to bear the fruits of your growth. And just additional expansions will not help. So, and, and then... Growth, um, things like, you know, everybody knows the term servant leadership. Maybe you should look for ways to have servant management. And think of uh, structures in, in terms of team of teams. Yeah? Ecosystems around products, services, results, and then ecosystems connecting with each other in themselves forming a new ecosystem instead of the old school command and control hierarchical structures. Maybe that's the future. Maybe that's the future is the, the extreme organization so that your organization bears fruits for its people, for your users, your customers. Network structures, little ecosystems working together across boundaries of departments and so on. A lot of companies, uh, so it's about agility in, in, in the face of perplexity. So let's try to not allow complexity to turn into that sort of mind-blocking perplexity and rather see it as a vast... Um, vast amount of opportunities, options. Yeah. And you know what? A lot of, a lot of those um, existing structures, silos, everybody wants to become agile, on the market, against competitors, and, and faster releases, shorter time to market, more quality, and so on. You know what? On the inside of those organizations, <coughs> those rigid, rigid, that's the antithesis of agile, right? When agile is adaptive, flexible, structures, rigid, governance on top of that, that is so rigid, that is so inflexible, 
Of course, those companies struggle by becoming agile on their market with their users and so on. And just introducing Scrum within those silos is really not going to help if they don't embrace those, what I would like to call those prime agile tenets, collaborat collaborative people working together across boundaries and so on, cross-functionally, multidisciplinary and so on, deliberate emergence and so on. That's sort of the future of our organizations. And this is going to be sort of not just the topic of my book, but hopefully also um, a positive way to define agile. So when going into management team, think asking them, what would you define as agile? And instead of then having to give them some sort of fuzzy thing of, yeah, it's a mindset, look for value statements, and then, oh yeah, so the left side over the right side, it's, it's rather difficult to explain. No, this is agile, collaborative people, deliberate emergence, value for a purpose. Think about that. And whenever you do Scrum or whatever process you want to have in place, at the heart of things, those three things should be in place for me. Otherwise, it's not agile. Any, any framework, any professional call themselves agile, my opinion should be thriving and reinforcing those, those things of agile. So, so I, I hope it's helpful and then uh, we'll see what happens. So just the uh, last definition, give you a definition of agility, perplexity. Um, so agile, just plain English, it's just if you, would have to if you would have to identify one word as a synonym, that would be adaptive but it can be a little bit more able to think and so on. Uh, my old definition of Agile, the mindset expressed to uh, Agile Manifesto, and then the last one that's sort of my new, it's in progress, so it might change, so uh, come visit me again maybe in some years' time, it might have changed, but still. People collaboratively provoking the emergence of value for a purpose. And so <laughs> it's full of buzzwords, I know, but they have a meaning for me, and it's a lot, for me it's a lot more tangible, actionable, than just describing Agile as a mindset. And it might help people get away from that old school industrial thinking that we're still facing. That old school industrial thinking, um, separations of functions, separations of people, that worked in the ordered stability space. It will not work in the complex novelty space. Cool. At least three minutes for questions. Least, let me thank you for staying at least again. So, I, who's going to the after party? A <laughs> couple of people? Okay, cool. I'm not, I I'm, 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 uh, have to get up tomorrow at 4 a.m. because of the great uh, number of flights between uh, Vilnius and Brussels. But still, okay. Thank you very much already for being here and a couple of questions. <laughs> Who have you collaborated with to create this uh, definition? Uh, nobody. I've just been listening to people, asking questions. What is the value? What does Agile mean for you? Looking back at my experience, uh, reading interviews, um, also overhearing this week still Alistair Coburn saying Agile has become too complicated. It's turned into something that we didn't want it to turn in. Um, Alistair is certainly working on a great thing called head, Heart of Agile. I think it's very similar. So. Uh, that's it, I've been, for the past, past year, my book it should have been finished already, just those struggles, finding those things, the why and looking for things, it's, it's been taking me now a year to look for people, ask, consult with people, meetups, ask for people's opinion, yep. Yep. Hi. I'm yep. here. Hey. So it's more, rather probably more comment than a question, but if you would like to comment on a comment, that's appreciated. So speaking of the rigid structures, one comment uh, is that I would like this audience to know that the well-marketed Spotify and their network structure under it is just a matrix in the end. So maybe just to emphasize what you said is that we should less focus on buzzwords like network organization, collaboration, and on so forth, we should focus on uh, people mindset mm -hmm. and attitude. Yep. And then you can have matrix, you can have any hierarchy. In the end, you will have the end result and people will deliver uh, based on those new, new modern management uh, frameworks. Yeah, well, and, and my hope or can I say my ambition was to make that even a bit more tangible and express mindset as those prime agile tenants. This is sort of how you can actually do it. It's just, uh, yeah. Yep. More questions?
By the way, don't be blocked on the idea of a definition too much. It's three elements. That's far more important for me. Collaborative people, deliberate emergence, and value for a purpose. Think about those things. This is sort of a yeah, definition for me. You know what I'm dreaming about? I listened to Joshua Kirievsky talking at Agile Prague, and he has four, but they are more or less the same. And you know, that's the joke that, oh, there are 11 frameworks, let's do one that will combine everything. Now we have 12. Is there any hope that all those awesome guys like you and Joshua and Alistair and whoever, you know, Agile is one, one manifesto because there were 17 yeah. people working on that together. Is there any, any chance you ever will sign something new together? Because you're actually talking about the same stuff. Yeah, I know. Th there's, there's movements in the, in the world. You see w people working on the same ideas. Um, I, I believe that at some point in time they will converge. But uh, we, don't, we don't have to enforce that. It, it will happen. It will happen. But by the way, those 17 people of the Agile Manifesto, the success of the... First of all, it was a, was a huge surprise to themselves that they actually did come up with something that they felt, yo, this is cool, it turned into the Agile Manifesto. The hopes of getting something aligned across those 70 people was sort of not too, too huge. Uh, the Agile Manifesto turning into a success was for those 70 people even more of a surprise. And I still hear uh, Uncle Bob, Bob Martin, regularly say, well, probably we will never agree on something again. <laughs> we have to agree on, well, that was unique still, M might still happen, we'll see what happens. Maybe, I don't know, I, I, don't, I don't feel like we have to enforce anything. Just, you see patterns emerging at some point in time. But just my, my absolute thing is, I don't want to give this a new name. The, new, the name Agile is fine. It's what we need. It's a paradigm, it's a set of worldviews. I just wanted to make it sort of more positive and, and almost actionable, like Scrum is actionable. Yeah. All right, we have time for one last question. Who is it going to be? Oh, everybody wants to go to the after party. Again, thank you very much for being here. Thank you for allowing me to share my ideas. I love it. Don't run away because we are still have some. We still have some books to hand out for feedback, so you can take like uh, up to five minutes to fill those forms out, and then we have six awesome books on agile to give out. Thank you. Yeah, you know what? If you believe in inspection and adaptation, it requires feedback. Give people feedback, yes. honest feedback, transparently. And uh, one more important announcement I have to make. We already have the date for Agile Tour Vilnius 2018, and it's October 25. Mark your calendars. And we have one keynote speaker confirmed. It's Gojko Adzic, one, the person who received many, many international awards on Agile testing and books on Agile. And he focuses on testing and behavioral patterns in Agile and consults companies uh, regards that. We're looking forward to meeting him and we would like to invite you all to join us next year as well. And thank you, Gunder. It welcome. was really nice. And here's a little something to remember Lithuania thank by. Thank you. <laughs>